Hello everyone, how are you going? And welcome back to Canada's Who's Who, the great little historical snippets that just show us all these different animals from all over North America. And so starting off with the killdeer. Hard to see, easy to hear, the killdeer named after its call is a common plover of America. Striking white bands on the forehead and chest break up the outline of the body. The straw colored legs are very long. Killdeer feed primarily on insects and beetles, many of which are pests like weevils and wireworms. Okay, that's good. The nest is only a depression in the ground lined with a few pebbles. Okay. The mottled eggs are hard to see. As with all ground nesting birds, the chicks too are well camouflaged. For more information on the killdeer, why not contact the Canadian Wildlife Service in Ottawa? Oh, I always just love the fact that they don't even list a number, but no, just the fact that this bird is incredible in terms of its plumage, it's just those lines are incredibly striking. It's like we can see here, it is almost as though it's two separate animals that have just been joined together, you know, you've got a seagull body almost, and then just all a zebra head. Let alone just looking at the eggs, or I guess a lack of looking at the eggs because they so look like stones. It is pretty darn impressive what kind of mottled nature that they have as well. I mean, I guess like you were saying, it certainly isn't too surprising considering I've never thought about it, but any of these ground dwelling birds are definitely going to be having a lot of camouflage, well, needed to be able to survive. But then I do wonder what kind of environments they live in because that looks quite rocky. And from what he was saying, that's where they have the nest, but then do they just go foraging in more tundra and grass and open fields where all the bugs and everything are going to be? The weevils, like you said, the pests. In saying that though, one of the best things that didn't happen in comparison to the rest of these videos is usually they mention something about it being threatened or extinct and nothing like that manner was mentioned. Just the fact that they are incredibly easy to hear but very difficult to see and so now I'm wondering how big are they because originally I was thinking more like maybe a pigeon sized bird, a little bit smaller than that, maybe like a minor bird but looking at those flowers it almost looks like it could be smaller. And so it is just time to have a look at what Google has for us. Here we go, the killdeer, oh sadly it doesn't have its little, actually maybe in sounds it can have it. Come on, show me. In our only video, sadly it doesn't have the traditional Google little button there. But looking down at the above, what is it going to be? Mass 88 grams, man. Birds are always incredible in that regard, but length 23 to 27 centimeters. All right, so yeah, it is kind of, I guess minor bird size would be the closest thing that I relatively see. Ah, but there it is, yes. The conservation status is of least concern, but the population is decreasing. And I wonder why that is. Is it just because they've been being forced out of traditional breeding grounds or is there just a lack of breeding grounds is it temperature related is it even just temperature because of bug related so many different factors into well the entire food chain can influence something like that and so there is really only one thing left to do just let me hear this guy oh okay oh that's not what i expected okay Interesting, interesting. I'm trying to listen to the killdeer because that is what he said is going, the name was derived from the sound and I feel as though that's a bit far-fetched, but hey, if you just want to be hearing something, then that's what it is. What is it? It's just grass. Canada's grasslands are spectacular ecosystems, home to an amazing variety of wildlife. <laughs> Many, like the black-tailed prairie dog, can't be found in any other type of habitat. Okay. Grasslands are also among our most endangered natural habitats. Human settlement has threatened many grassland species. Some, like the burrowing owl and swift fox, are now at risk in Canada. But conservation groups, landowners and governments are joining forces to help restore grasslands. In one Saskatchewan project, the black-footed ferret, a species that no longer exists in the wild in Canada, is being reintroduced to its natural habitat. Oh, that's... We can all do our part to protect grasslands. Join a grasslands conservation group. Work with landowners to restore natural grasslands in your area. Yeah. And that's just a start. To learn more about grasslands and how to help protect them, visit hww.ca. Well, clearly this one was a lot more modern as they do give you a website, but it's also interesting. I wonder in comparison to let's say the 50s, the 60s and the 70s when the original ones were coming out, is it as much of a problem now because farming is just expanded into these areas that it wasn't before just because it has to, especially just because Canada is so big and so just driving through the prairies for 20 hours along with nothing 
nothing around can certainly take its toll but i guess that is also a very superficial thing going okay there's nothing around it's just grass but really like they said there it's a very incredible ecosystem that lives amongst all these little ruts and divots and grass and everything that is going to be all over the place but looking at it now i was wondering what looks so weird about it and i've just realized that of course it's in the name but for goodness sake there is zero trees in this entire scene and i don't know if that is because it's been cultivated so there are no trees and that's uh, just an entire farming land but otherwise why are there no trees i guess i understand if there was not going to be a forest because of water restrictions but why not a single tree like even even outback australia has the odd tree but that's just grass as far as the eye can see in canada grasslands include the vast prairies that stretch from manitoba to alberta significant areas of grassland also occur in British Columbia. Smaller areas of grassland such as prairie and savanna habitats can be found in Ontario and eastern part of Vancouver Island. Wow, so they really are all over Canada, but my goodness, like I said, why is there no trees in any of this? I mean, I guess it becomes great for grazing, but not great for shade you know even cows and all these bigger animals just even use them for shade as well as just scratching posts and things like that like cows do here in australia that i know of and so i'm just wondering why is it so geological symmetrical in saying that though it does make for some pretty incredible landscape photography even just having the animals mixed in there as well but just the forever rolling hills mixed with the probably constant perfect skies because there's nothing really around to stir up the atmosphere like mountains and everything like that and so unless you have a thunderstorm roll through which is probably Probably going to be fairly regular given the open nature of it there's just going to be nothing else around and so with a combination of so many of these factors it's an absolute must that Canada looks into the conservation of these areas because if nothing else it's their bread and butter you know the geology be it the mountains be it the snow-capped mountains and then all the way down to the four and four and you've got the prairie dogs and all these other things that I feel as though half of these who's who's are about they all live there the barring owl the swift fox the everything all of the Canada's bread and butter just lives in these areas and you can't be wiping that out even if you do have to farm even if you do have to do this no grasslands for all for everyone to enjoy the northern ringneck snake is beautiful these snakes are light blue to black with the band of orange or yellow like a pretty necklace around the neck the belly is striking bright yellow or orange this snake is very secretive. They live under rocks or leaf litter near rivers and shady wooded areas. Harmless to humans, ringnecks have weak venom in their saliva, which they use to help catch their prey. When threatened, this snake may show its belly or release a pungent odor. The ringneck snake eats insects, salamanders, earthworms, and frogs. To protect this beautiful snake, we should keep their habitat free from pollution. For more information on the northern ringneck and other wildlife, visit hww.ca. <laughs> That was fantastic. I love the fact that I had no idea what it meant by homegrown video at the start here, but I can certainly understand where they're coming from now. But just coming back to the snake, the ring neck snake, I can understand where it gets its name, but that belly is so striking. I think in combination with the ring neck, that that's just where its name should really be derived from. Look at that, it looks like plastic. However, that is certainly not the only thing that I learned from this video because it looks as though it was a very, very small snake, like worm-sized snake, and then they went on to say that it eats frogs and worms and all other things. And so now I'm wondering how big are these rocks and leaves and straw? Either way, not the biggest of snakes, and that is just fine, considering it's a completely harmless snake that's just going around doing its thing, just smelling nastily, apparently. I mean, I would also just love to know how is it possible that a snake emits an odor? Is it kind of sweating? It out or is it more of a venom situation like a spray well, how is it possibly emitting an odor from a snake I, I understand fangs and how they work and even just general constriction but an odor from a snake never heard of that before so straight to google we go ring neck snake oh it looks like it's eating a lizard there perhaps which doesn't really help me in terms of the size but oh i'm seeing a bit of a youtube video there that definitely showcases that it's well no bigger than the palm of your hand so to say let's just see does images provide us any more context of size yes it does and i guess to be honest i wasn't far off with thinking that it's a worm because i've seen worms that pretty much rival that snake size especially just this guy look at the size of it that is insane i mean that is just not what australia generally has you know we have king browns and red belly blacks and all these snakes that well 
for one, their venom does a little bit more than uh, just, well, not harm you. And also, there's no way you can just be holding it in the palm of your hand unless it's maybe just been born. And really, I'm just amazed by the fact that they can have different colors because the other one, and most of them seem to be displaying the yellow belly, but then the red tip as well. I'm wondering how they're getting that. This guy's kind of blue looking on top of me. Maybe it's the lighting, but either way, they certainly seem to be able to just display an incredible range, incredible vividness to their colors. Because yeah, a red belly also does have some pretty incredible colors and on a much bigger scale at the same time there's no yellow and blue and everything else that the other guy has. So look I guess even though the ring neck snake and the red belly black would definitely have a different use case if you were trying to use them for pest control really I reckon everyone could use one of the ring neck snakes just to clean up the odd little bug around the house. The cougar is the largest of North American cats. There are usually two to five cubs per litter. Their spotted coats will disappear in about six months, and they will stay with the mother for one to two years. An adult cougar may weigh 150 pounds, measure seven and a half feet in length, and can leap 20 to 30 feet with ease. <laughs> what? The steady encroachment of man into his territory and relentless bounty hunting have driven the cougar into the most remote sections of the Rocky Mountain Range. Fair enough. But occasional sightings are still made in almost all Canadian provinces. Wow. For more information on the cougar, contact Man. the Canadian Wildlife Service in Ottawa. I mean, look, I've heard of the cougar before, but I've never heard of the fact that it has those kind of stats. I mean, I guess it's a big cat and cats jump from the ground up on top of fences, but 20 to 30 feet seven to ten meters i mean is that vertical or is that horizontal is that on a 45 what is that because regardless it's very 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 impressive to the point where it does make me wonder even though they said it was the biggest of the north american cats does that have one of the biggest leaps of any of the big cats because i can't imagine that a lion beats a cougar in terms of what it can jump because a lion's just so big and heavy i mean to be fair though 150 pounds or 70 kilos is nothing to be snuffed at either 70 kilos of cat coming at you oh no thank you and i also believe that he said it was up to seven feet long. May weigh 150 pounds, yeah. measure seven and a half feet in length, <sighs> and can leap feet. 20 to 30 feet with it. You're literally jumping triple to quadruple your own length and seven and a half feet is massive I guess from nose to tail and it's only going to be using its tail for so much balancing but seven and a half feet long still it's it's incredible it's like it's a micro insect that has these incredible stats like a flea you know 400 times its own height but it's 150 150 pound animal not 150 kilos. Well on the top right here apparently they also have a modeling career look at that that's just such an Instagram photo it's such a selfie looking photo but oh Hang on a second, I've never realized that a puma is a cougar. Really? Okay, well that's news to me, there we go. But some other news to me is just all of these other stats that like I said are just insane speed, 80 kilometers an hour. Can you imagine, well I guess like it says here, 50 to 100 kilos of cat running at 80 kilometers an hour charging for you. There was no way you were getting out of the way of that thing. They can leap 20 feet at you. I mean, I guess it just has a strength tab right here, and so also known as mountain lions as well. Really? No. A mountain lion? No, surely not. A mountain lion as well as a puma? No way! Cougars are known for their strength, agility, and awesome ability to jump. Their exceptionally powerful legs enable them to leap 30 feet from a standstill or to jump 15 feet straight up a cliff wall. 15 feet! Wow, these things are so incredible. Five meters just up. That is like a flea. Oh, and hang on a second. What? Its range spans from the Canadian Yukon to the Southern Andes in South America, and it's the most widespread of any large wild terrestrial mammal in the Western Hemisphere. What is possibly going to be beating it for distance in the Eastern Hemisphere? That is insane. Either way, I guess I now just know that the cougar has absolutely every skill tree maxed out between power to weight ratio, speed, weight itself, fangs, teeth, claws. It's got it all, and it's just everywhere. And no wonder it's everywhere, because I can't can't imagine it has too many predators of which i guess once again we have google's handy dandy button back and i think 
That is not what I expected. What is it? Ah, there we go. That is the one that I definitely have heard before. I think I can only imagine from maybe some Disney and those kind of films. But hey, all of these who's who's have been absolutely incredible and I think also very effective in what they set out to accomplish in the beginning. Even back from the 60s, people telling me, ah, oh, I remember just getting home from school or seeing this on TV and going, ah, oh, that's the name of the bird that I'm hearing but I didn't never get to see or whatever it may be. All of these things that were once maybe endangered or unknown, whatever it may be, now you look at them on Google and it says least concern, population increasing, all these different things and go, yes, at least that's where knowledge is power. You can actually effectively just stop hunting these people into extinction or maybe just change the way you view an ecosystem, whatever it may be. Every little piece of the puzzle does change how the overall ecosystem, the overall family tree does behave. And really there's a reason that we have all of them still is because we need all of them. So we better start looking after them all.